very blessed morning to you, Sunday morning to you. I trust that your week has been great. It's always a joy to come your way and to share fellowship with you through this medium via God's word. It's, it's always a joy that we don't take a privilege and an opportunity we don't take for granted at all. If you are new to our YouTube channel, we encourage you that you subscribe and click all notifications so that you always be prompted when we are on. If you're also on Facebook, we encourage that you start a watch party and be blessed and allow other people the opportunity to also come and join the ministry of God's word. Why don't you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today. We bless you for the beginning of yet another week. Thank you for your message that has kept us alive all through the month of September and will continue to preserve and keep us. We honor you and we bless you. And this time of sharing, Spirit of God, my members are yielded to you, my tongue, my mind. Every part of my being is yielded to you, Spirit of God, absolutely. Possess me, grant me clarity of thought and of utterance in the name of the Lord Jesus. Open the heart of every hearer, open the mind of every hearer. And Lord, I pray that in this moment, your word will come like rain and let it water every ground and cause it to become fruitful. Thank you that your word will be fruitful and will bear 64, 100 fold according as every heart is prepared. We honor you and we bless you, Lord, and it is done in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Great. Wonderful. We gradually bring in our series on growing into maturity to a close. I'll do maybe one or two other more sessions and then we'll bring it to a close. Today we are going to continue growing into maturity. Uh, uh, Luke chapter 2 verse 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. You know that if you follow the teaching in our uh, earlier episodes or earlier teaching sessions, you realize that we've been focusing on growing into maturity and the person we've been learning from is the life of Jesus. The Bible said Jesus, when he was born, he grew became strong in spirit that is symbolic of spiritual growth and the bible says the grace of god was upon him so jesus as a man had to grow and if you are going to become all that god will have us become it's important that we appreciate the place of spiritual growth spiritual growth is something that we cannot do without if we must become the kind of people god will have us become then spiritual growth must of necessity be engaged and spiritual growth is not something we wish into manifestation. It's something that we deliberately make happen. That's why sometimes you can meet somebody in church and he's been in church for a long time. He's aged in church but not aged in Christ. You can be old in church and not necessarily be old in Christ. For you to grow in Christ and become the kind of person God will have you become, you need to be intentional about spiritual growth. At the earlier part, we walk you through a series of things that are foundational to be, to be able to grow spiritually. And in this teaching, we are just continuing in what we began last week, last week and last two weeks, on I must fellowship to grow. What we've been, the question we've been seeking to answer is, what must I do to grow? What must I do to grow? Apart from deciding that you are going to grow, apart from becoming disciplined to do the things you need to grow, you need to know what you must do to grow. A lot of people genuinely really want to grow, but they don't know what they must do to grow. And that's why I did this teaching series to help you to know what exactly is expected of you to grow. Jesus did some things that helped him or aided in the spiritual growth. And we must do the same if we ought to grow spiritually. The first thing Jesus did is that Jesus gave himself to spiritual food. So we said to grow, I must feed to grow. That's what we started with. And last week, we also said that Jesus fellowship to grow. If you are going to grow spiritually, we must be people who understand what it means to fellowship. And we said there are two levels of fellowship critical for spiritual growth. One is fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. That is on a private level. That on your own as a believer, you must learn to spend time with God, sharing fellowship with God in the Word, sharing fellowship with God in prayer. God desires to share fellowship with you daily. The Bible says, Jesus rising up a great while before day, he departed and went into a solitary place, and there he prayed. 
in the book of Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Essentially, what Jesus was doing was sharing fellowship with his father. So we spent some time talking about the need for personal prayer. We are not talking about corporate prayer here. We are not talking about church prayer. We are talking about not even praying with your partner. We are talking about personally engaging the altar of prayer, not just for needs to be met, but to be intimate with your heavenly father who loves you and desires to be intimate with you. So that's what we looked at last week and last week. Today, we want to take it a step further and we are looking at I must fellowship to grow. And this is the second level of fellowship. If you are going to become like God, spending time with God is critical. But not only spending time with God, you must also spend time with others who have learned to spend time with God. And that is sharing fellowship with fellow believers. That's what we are talking about today. To come to Christ, you have to believe for yourself. But to live your life in Christ, you need to learn to relate with other people. We serve a God who is a very relational God. If you look at the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 6, Matthew chapter 6 verse 9, we can look at that. The Bible says, when you pray, in this manner therefore pray, say, our Father, take note, the number of pronouns that are used there, not the first person pronoun, but the number of second person and third person pronouns that are used there. He says, our Father, he didn't say my Father, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And when you go down, you see even more, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he said, give us, he didn't say give me this day, give us this day. You go on to the next uh, verse, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass and lead us not into temptation, verse 13. He says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I mean, you can count again and again and again, and you see that God is concerned about a family. When you believe in God, you will be immediately believe in God brings you to belonging to the family of God. So once you get born again, you become a member of God's family. You don't just believe and live in isolation. Once faith in Christ is a personal decision, life in Christ is a corporate life. You cannot live life in Christ alone. So the Bible said Jesus was found in the temple. Luke chapter 2 verse 46 to 47. Jesus was found in the temple and he was sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And I want to believe that he was not sitting in the temple alone. He had other people sitting in the temple with him and they were both, all of them were listening and asking questions. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 41 to 42, the Bible said, those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to the church. And they continued step us in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued in fellowship. They continued in fellowship. The word fellowship comes from an original Greek word which uh, is translated as fellowship. Fellowship comes from kononia and kononia or kononia has to do with participation, to kononia, to fellowship means to participate, to contribute, to share, and to communicate. That's what it means. Fellowship means participation, it means contribution, it means sharing, it means that you are communicating and sharing. That's what it means. Fellowship means more than just coming to church and then saying hi to a, a brother or a sister after service or doing a handshake and then going home. No. Fellowship means we share our life in Christ together. We contribute to one another's development. We participate in the events in our lives together as a church. We communicate our faith together. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 44, the New Living Translation says, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. That's fellowship. They met together and in one place and shared everything they had. They met together. Take note of the word met together because when we talk about fellowship, we are talking about meeting together. We are talking about assembling together. We are talking about communicating together. We are talking about participating in one another's life. We are talking about contributing for the advancement of God's kingdom. That's basically what fellowship is about. Fellowship gives us the opportunity 
to be able to fulfill all the many one another's in scripture. There are too many one another's in the New Testament. He said we should pray for one another, we should communicate with one another, we should love one another, we should rebuke one another, we should exalt one another. All of these things cannot be done except when we are in fellowship. When we look at scripture, there were people who never took fellowship for granted. The man David spoke in Psalm 112 verse 1. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of God. Why the house of God? Because the meeting place is a place of fellowship. It's a place where the assembling of the saints happens. In the book of uh, uh, Psalm again, 84 verse 10. He said, a single day in your court is better than a thousand anywhere else. Amazing. He said, I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than to live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Amazing. David says, I would rather prefer that I'm a gatekeeper. I'm an usher, or so to speak, in the house of God than to dwell or live a good life among wicked people. In the book of Psalm 24, 27 verse 4, he said, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most in um, he said, is to seek, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. That's David. The man after God's own heart loved to be in fellowship with fellow believers in church. May I ask you this morning, is coming to church a delight? In this era of Facebook worship and YouTube worship, a lot of people have just replaced that with going to church. And as much as I appreciate God's wisdom in making these platforms available for fellowship, it is never designed to replace corporate fellowship with the saints in church. On YouTube, we can't share too many things. But when we meet together, we are able to share intimately with one another. We are able to communicate intimately with one another. We are able to fully participate in what is happening in the fellow believer's life. That's why Virtual fellowship can never replace actual fellowship. And I want to encourage you by this, through this medium, if you are watching and you are not committed to any church, I want to encourage you to find a Bible-believing church and then make sure you get established and rooted there. This is supposed to be a complement or this is supposed to be a means to fellowship when you cannot physically appear in God's presence with, in the company of fellow believers to worship. That's where this platform becomes so vital. But where you have the opportunity, you are not restricted, you are not sick, you are not uh, invalid, you are not in any, you are, you are not being capacitated in any way to go into fellowship. You have no business just staying and watching service through this video. Jesus was also another man who never joked with fellowship. In the book of Luke chapter 4, verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been raised or read, as he always did on the Sabbath. Take note, as he always did on the Shabbat. The Bible said he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day or Shabbat and stood up for to read. Jesus always had the habit of going to church. Church going was a habit. It wasn't something he did because he felt like going to church. We live in times where some believers who stay at home and rather not go to church because you just simply don't feel like going to church. Monday through Friday, you never felt, many times you may even have felt like not going to work. But because work is so important to you, you know your upkeep, your livelihood depends on it. You have to be there. Much more if you began to see that your very existence is not just your livelihood, your paycheck that depends on your boss, your very existence, the breath you hold on to, the breath that keeps you alive, everything you need to be alive and to live meaningful life, that the strength, the health you have, everything comes from God. The Bible said it is in him we live, it is in him we move, it is in him we have our being. The early church also never took fellowship for granted. And in scripture, we are exhorted not to take fellowship for granted. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, Hebrews 10, 25 and 26, the New Living Translation puts it in a very interesting way. The New Living Translation, it says, let us not neglect our meeting together. Let us not neglect our meeting together. 
COVID-19 has kept a lot of people at home. And I believe that now quite a number of people have started going to church. But there are still many others who are still at home. And if you are at home, though you have what it takes to be in fellowship, I want to encourage you to repent and get back to church. Because that's where you belong. The Bible says we should not neglect our meeting together. Our meeting together. Our meeting together. As some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing nearer. Why is fellowship with believers so critical? Why is fellowship so important? Why is fellowship strongly emphasized? If you go through the book of Acts, many times, many times you hear, and they gathered together and they met in homes, and they gathered together through the gospel, uh, the letters. We also see the, ha- the church in your house. I mean, fellowship was something that the early church never took for granted at all. And we also need to give it all the seriousness scripture demands or God demands from us. Why is fellowship so important? The first reason why I believe fellowship is critical in your life as a Christian is because as a child of God, we are all made, in fact, from even Christian perspective, we are all made in the image of God. Every person walking on the planet is made in the image of God. So every human being is born to relate. Every human being is born to fellowship. God made us in his image. Now, after what image is God? God exists in three persons. He shares fellowship. The Godhead shares fellowship. God the Son, God the, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. They are intimate in their fellowship. They do nothing without the other. And the Bible says in the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image. Everything they did, they did together. When man rebelled, he said, let us go down and see. We see them operating together. When Jesus came, he said, I came not to do my own way, but the will of the Father that sent me. When he was leaving, he said, the Holy Spirit will come. We see them working in partnership, working in contribution, working in sharing in everything. That's fellowship. The first picture of fellowship we see is in the Godhead. God made us in his image, and as people made in the image of God after his likeness, we desire and long for fellowship. That's why you see people congregating around bottles of beer after work. Unbelievers congregate. Either they are watching a football match together, or they are drinking together, or they are doing one thing or the other together. Just ask, and and this is so because all of us have been, were born or wired to relate. We need people. We need people around us. Every time you are doing an event, when people come around, you feel that your joy is complete and we all feel a sense of fulfillment and joy when we are people around us. No matter how much money you have, when you don't have people to share in your joy, you are all, amongst all men most poor. We need people. That's the first reason. The second reason why fellowship is critical is because Man was not created or designed to do life alone. We were not designed to do life alone. Man was not designed to function and go through life alone. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, when God made man, he made everything. Two and two made them after. He made everything. He looked at man and said, it is not good that man should be alone. Genesis 2, 18. The Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. So God saw that man was not living life the way he ought to live alone. God does not exist alone. He exists in three persons. Man cannot exist alone. So it, it, it's simply impossible to do a meaningful life alone. When people are always left to themselves, they begin to contemplate suicide. Problems that you can do or you can handle cheaply when you have people around you can overwhelm you when you decide to carry it all by yourself. That's why somebody said, a problem shared is a problem half solved. The moment we have a burden, no matter how heavy the burden, and we have people to share in our burden, it's as if the burden is almost gone. That's why you and I need fellowship. Fellowship is critical because we were not designed to go through life alone. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 to 10, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. Look at verse 10. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Amazing. 
someone who falls alone, the people who desire to go through life alone, they are in for a big trouble. You can't live the Christian life alone. You need someone to encourage you. You need someone to exhort you. You need someone. There are times where you feel weak. There are times where you don't feel like doing the things you ought to do and you need someone to challenge you. That's why God keeps us in fellowship. That's why when we get born again, we are brought into church and we join the church and we become a part of God's family. The first Adam could not do life alone. When Jesus came, he couldn't do life alone. The second Adam could not do life alone. He had 12 disciples. He went everywhere with. Even when he could not move with the 12, you always see him in the company of John, James, and Peter. Why? Because we are all wired for fellowship. Life is not designed for us to go through it alone. As a recreated child of God, you also need to share fellowship with other recreated children of God. Number three is because you are a part of God's family. As a child of God, you belong to God's family. Every child of God belongs to God's family. In the book of John chapter 1 verse 12, John 1 12, the Bible said, as many as receive him, to them he gave power. He gave them the right to become the children of God. As many as receive him. You are not the only person who has received Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so, you are a child of God. Every other person who is also uh, confessed Jesus and has believed in Christ is also a child of God. So you are members, you belong to a family, a very large family. But particularly in this context, I'm looking at the local church, the local church of which you are a part. You belong to the family of God. That assembly of God's family, you belong to it. In the book of Ephesians 2 verse 9, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners, you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. You should be excited about that. You are a member of God's family. You belong to God's family. You are not alone. Don't allow Satan to let you uh, feel alone or feel that you are left all to yourself. No, you belong to a larger family. Every child of God, anyone who believes in Christ and confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior is your fellow member. And particularly those in the same household of faith with you. You are a member of God's family. The second, the fourth reason why it's important that you don't take fellowship for granted is because you are a part of God's building. You know, there are many things that come together to form a building. Jesus is the foundation. All of us are part of the building. Some may be pillars, others may be blocks. But all of us come together to form the building. You can't take, if you go and say, I'm going to remove a piece of block out, the building cannot stand. That's why it's important that you don't take your, your attachment or your involvement, your sharing, your contribution in the church for granted at all. You need the family of God. God has planted you in his family. God has made you a part of his building. So your part and your role in the church is very critical and important. There are people who think that, oh, as for me, if I don't go to church for the next one month, it doesn't matter. Hey, that is a life from the pit of hell. It matters. Your presence matters. Much more your contribution matters. Number five. Number five is that we are all members of Christ's body. And if there is any analogy that makes your membership in the local church or your fellowship in the local church or your re regular gathering, with the saints of God in the local church more important. I believe it is this particular. You know, there are many metaphors in scripture about the church. One important metaphor is the fact that the church is a body. The church of Jesus is a body. We are told in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26, 12 to 26, it said the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. We are going to continue, you see. So all of us don't come from the same background. This is one big family where people come from different backgrounds. In the church, in our fellowship, we can meet somebody who belongs to the Ashanti tribe, another belongs to Airways, another belongs to uh, uh, Frafras, another. We are all, in the early church, they had Jews, they had Gentiles, they had slaves, they had free, but they were all together as one 
as members in one body, which is the body of Christ. Look at verse 14. He said, yes, the body has different parts. The body has many different parts and not just one part. If the foot says I'm not a part of the body because I'm not the hand, does that, does that make it any less a part of the body? And if the ear says I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? And if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies are many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it to be. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. He said, yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. While the more honorable parts do not require the special care, so God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the other parts are glad. Amazing. The Bible says, all of you, verse 27, all of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Did you hear that? Each of us, you are a part of it. That's why anytime you are missing in fellowship, something is missing. Never see your absence in church as, oh, it doesn't matter. Nobody actually misses my absence. Somebody does. Somebody does. It's not just when you are playing a role. When you are playing a role in, in, in church, it makes it even more important. But even when you are not playing any role, your, your appearance in the church, your sitting in the congregation, your smile in church, ministers healing and life to someone. It's always important. Never ever take your fellowship, your participation, your contribution. No matter how small or insignificant it is, your contribution is important. Your sharing in the life of the church is important. Your participation is very, very critical. And then number six is that fellowship is critical for your spiritual growth and development. If you are going to grow, you need to fellowship. The Bible calls that in the book of Psalm 92, verse 12 to 14. He said, those that are planted in the house of God, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. Those that are planted, verse 12 says, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar. See, he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Among the many metaphors that the Bible uses to describe people of God, one of them is trees, the palm tree, and sometimes trees. He said, the righteous shall grow like a palm tree, shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. He said, those that are planted in the house of God, they shall flourish in the court of our God. For any tree to be fruitful, that tree must first be planted. And you and I know that if you plant a tree and you keep on transplanting it after every week, after every two, two weeks, that tree can never grow and bear fruit. The tree needs to be planted, it needs to be watered, it needs to be taken care of, it needs to be weeded around, it needs to be nurtured, and then after some time, that tree begins to grow. That is what our commitment to the church, our consistency in fellowship does. When we become planted and established and rooted in church, not minding the various things that will seek to move us away from the church. When we become rooted and planted, then we are set to grow. Then we are set to grow. As long as you continue moving from church to church, shifting your route after every week, after every month, there is no way you are going to grow and grow in a healthy manner. The Bible says, He shall appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that the Lord's name might be glorified. By their fruit, we shall know them. When you become truly planted, you begin to bear fruit. And among the fruit you bear is the fruit of godly character, the fruit of maturity. And then, of course, the seventh reason why fellowship must not be taken for granted 
is because fellowship is a biblical command. Yes, you heard me. Fellowship is a biblical command. If all the other reasons I've spoken about don't make sense to you, you must understand that you don't have to feel like you want to be part of fellowship. You don't, want to, you don't have to feel because there are some people who claim they love Jesus but they hate Jesus' people. You can't love Jesus and not love his people. The church is God's people. They may not be perfect. They may not be your type of people. They may not have gone to the school you went to. But everyone in the church is God's child, is God's uh, uh, family. And so to belong to God and to have faith in God and to share fellowship with God is to be willing and ready to share fellowship with God's people. So it's a biblical command. The Bible says we must not give up the meeting of ourselves together. Look at it in the Good News Version. He said, let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some people do. And there's one important habit you need to develop in order to grow spiritually is the habit of being regular in church. Not today you are on and the next one month you are off. No, being regular Sunday you are there, Wednesdays you are there, small group meetings you are there. Being available in fellowship at all these levels helps you to grow spiritually. Number eight is because God releases uncommon blessings upon the harmonious gathering of the saints. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, Oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He says it is like a precious ointment poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his head, of his robe. It is as the dew of Hermon were falling on the Mount Zion, or Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. You saw it. God bestows his blessing every time we gather. Every time we meet in fellowship, amazing blessings happen that you and I have no idea of. You remember Jacob had an encounter. He said, the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. God is in the assembling of the saints and it takes a revelation to know it. When you catch a revelation of what our fellowship does, every time we meet, the impact and the difference it's making in your life, you will never take it for granted. There are many things that bring transformation in our life, but because we don't see them, we take them for granted. Fellowship is one of such. And when we talk about fellowship, we are talking about three levels of fellowship. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 46, as I close, Acts 2, verse 46, and they continue daily with one accord in the temple and in breaking of bread from house to house and did, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. There are three levels of fellowship essential for spiritual growth. One is temple or corporate fellowship. Temple or corporate fellowship. Where we meet on Sundays, where we meet on midweeks, and we are taught the word of God. That's one platform for our spiritual growth. Fellowship with other believers where you are taught and trained for the work of the ministry. That's what coming to church is about. We come on Sundays to be taught and trained. We come on Wednesdays to be taught and trained and equipped for ministry and then of course house to house fellowship this is where we learn to share practical love with the saints in small group meetings as we learn to study the word of God together care for one another and pray for one another that's what we call the cell meetings and very soon like we told you we are going to relaunch our cells we suspended it because of the COVID and we are going to relaunch it very soon and we encourage that once it's launched whether on a virtual platform or in actual meetings. I want to encourage you not to take it for granted at all. It's critical that you become a part of a small group meeting because you need it in order to develop your gift. You need it to see that you are also practically making a difference in other believers' lives. And of course, the other one where usually there's a lot of challenge and a lot of people don't sign up is fellowship with other believers as we serve and work together to advance the, serve, the, the cause of Christ. And that is service unit fellowship. Being part of the choir. You come to work together with the choir to advance. Being part of a media team that put together this broadcast. That is, and you know, when usually we come to work together, most of the time that's when challenges happen. And sometimes people withdraw from fellowship at this level because they are offended. 
Because when we come together to work together, that's when we begin to rub shoulders with each other and we begin to step on one another's toes. But listen, when that happens, it is all an avenue and an opportunity to grow. God grows us in many ways. He grows us through his word. He grows us through the various experiences we go through in life. And then most importantly, he grows us up through relationships. Relating with people who sometimes provoke you. Relating with people who sometimes anoint you. Relating with people that sometimes seek to provoke something negative out of you. They all help to shape your character and make you the kind of person God will have you become. I trust that this broadcast today has been a great blessing to you. Next week, we are going to continue on part two. On how fellowship, how God grows us or how God brings us into maturity through fellowship. So we bow our heads as we share a word of prayer today. If you've been blessed by the broadcast, speak to God and ask him to help you to appreciate the value of fellowship and to bring you to a place where you never take fellowship for granted. Lord, we thank you. We bless you today. Thank you that we are not going to take fellowship for granted. We are going to take fellowship with the things seriously. Sunday, we will be in your presence with your people. Wednesdays, we'll be in your presence with your people. At our small group meetings, we'll be in your presence with your people sharing fellowship. We honor you and we bless you. And it is done in Jesus' precious name. Maybe you are tuned to the broadcast. You are yet to come into fellowship with God. Fellowship with the believers begins with fellowship with God. Because until you become a member of God's family, your fellowship with the believers is a painful exercise. You want to give your life to Christ, pray the simple prayer of faith with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today. I admit I'm a sinner and I call upon you. Come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me and making me your own in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you pray that prayer in faith, you'll become a member of God's family. From today on us, you are a child of God. You belong to God's family. We want to hear from you and to help you develop in your relationship and grow in your work with God. Send us a WhatsApp, send us a mail, and let us be able to reach out to you. God richly bless you.